Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I have to tell you, it is absolutely awesome to be here. And the reason is, it's the first event in ages. I don't know about you, but for me, it's the first speaking engagement since this whole, sorry, for, forgive my French, this whole shit show started. And it just feels amazing. And yesterday, we already had great presentations, great talks, great discussions, and I'm super happy to talk a bit about the future of robotics and robotic governance. I, I do believe that we will need governance frameworks for robotics and artificial intelligence. And why? I'm going to tell you in a second. The only thing that bothers me a bit is that the timer now displays 10 minutes, and I have been told that it's 20 minutes, but we're going to work around that. So. Um, uh, okay, could I please have the slides? <laughs> <laughs> Until we start. Um, ah, perfect, cool. I want actually to start talking about innovation. And some of you m might already know me. There are some former colleagues of mine who are already filming. Thank you, shout out to you. Um, it, I have new slides, you wouldn't believe it. And but I still want to start with that one, because that is a German inventor from the 1940s. He actually believed that the future of television would be glasses. The only thing I cut off were two meter long antennas. He looked a little bit like a Martian. And why am I bringing this up when I'm talking about innovation? Well, because he had the most important characteristics of an innovation, an invention. He had something new. Unfortunately, he was missing out on the second one, which was market success. Uh, obviously, in the 1940s, this was not really successful. If he had been working in the early 2000s for Samsung, maybe, he would have been the man, you know? And so I'm bringing this up because sometimes I feel in robotics we're a little bit at the same spot. There are great ideas out there. There are great tech, there's great technology. Unfortunately, sometimes I don't really see it permeating into the market. And this is why I love these events, because this is where you see what is available and when you push it into industry. Same thing happened here, you know. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the first cars. Actually, you wouldn't have invested, because it was not really fast. In the UK, at least, somebody had to walk in front of it with a red flag to tell this is a car that has no horses. It's going that way and not that way, because you, without the horses, how should you know which direction it was moving? And so basically, this was a toy for the rich. And sometimes, especially when you think about service robotics or robotics at home, well, to be honest, this is something that we still have to listen to. I transitioned recently from industry to academia, so now the good thing is I can tell you wise words. I don't have to realize them. You have to build the shit. Um, on the other hand, you know, it, it, it never really feels good. I would also like to start with First of all, talking about what is a robot, because when we're talking about building robots and maybe regulating robots, the question is, what really is a robot? And I can tell you, this newspaper, so there was Financial Times, I think, three years ago or four years ago, this got me a call from my CEO at 6 a.m. in the morning, because there it basically says Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, said, robotics is the future of work. And my CEO at the time believed that Microsoft is going to enter robotics. But if you really read closely what he was saying, Satya actually was talking about bots, about software, about artificial intelligence. And in the public perception, we're currently facing the issue that people are mixing all that up. Smart systems, smart assistants, Siri, Alexa, nice robot doggies like that over there, and all the systems are just called a robot. I humbly disagree. For me, but I, I'm more, well, now my colleagues might disagree. I'm not really a robotics engineer and computer scientist, but I still feel like a robotics engineer. So I do believe a robot is something that you can touch and that has a physical representation. If it is just software, then I would prefer speaking about bots or smart systems. But currently, there is no binding definition of what really a robot is. And this internationally leads to a lot of issues. 
Nevertheless, now I told you what is not a robot, uh, now I want to tell you how I think that robotics is going to evolve, and I still believe it's going to evolve in four phases. The first one has already happened. It's how to weld and bolt and glue together a car as fast as possible. That's something that we have been doing for 60 years. A lot of companies, be they orange, gray, red, blue, uh, where's the blue one? I saw one before. So uh, this is something that has been around. The second one, this is the phase that we've now entered. This is cognitive, smart, and also especially sensitive and safe robots. Robots that I can touch, that I can interact with. Robots like they're standing everywhere around you here. If I think service robotics is still not utterly sexy because I want robots that also move around. I don't want to go to the robot. I want the robot to come to me. And ultimately, they have to be smart. But for a smart robot, we need the confluence of robotics and mechatronics and artificial intelligence. So we have seen a lot of those robots. This is also, a, a, in the public perception, a robot, our autonomous driving. We're going to see things like this, service robots that are going to cook our meals. Um, well, and later today, you're also going to learn about underwater robotics. And robots can go where we cannot go. They can do things people cannot do. They can help us in outer space, in nuclear power plants. And so this is a big field of robotics. And I surely believe they can help us tackle the sustainable development goals. So the United Nations comes up with these 17 goals that they believe that by 2030 have to be solved in order to make the world a better place. I utterly believe that robotics will help us to tackle those. The ways in which, that's up to you to find those solutions. But robotics also brings along a lot of questions, especially with the general public out there. So, okay, some of those you know, stupid examples like who should be killed by the autonomous car, the old lady or the little kids. There is no clear answer to that one as it's a philosophical experiment, but there is interesting research. The last thing I read about this is, why do we not let the car randomize? So I'm sitting in the car, I have to take this decision. Why do I not let take mathematics take the decision? I cannot decide anymore myself. Something is going to happen. I might not like it anyways, but the car and technology is taking the decision. You might object, you might not like it, but at least it's the, currently the fairest solution to the problem that I read in a long while. But those are questions that we have to discuss. We have to discuss about how are people going to work together with robots. Do people want to work together with robots, or is this something that they object to? Currently, I think we're seeing that in most cases they're pretty excited. But there is also research that shows that people start sabotaging robots. So for example, they put a screwdriver somewhere, they dislocate cables and all that. And when you ask them and say, why did you do that? Then they say, because the robot doesn't have a Monday. Because the robot is always the same speed. Because the robot never gets tired. So maybe we have to make robots a little bit more flexible so that it's better for humans to work with them. We have been fighting for 50, 60 years to eliminate variance in the production process. Maybe we need this, this variance again for personal, psychological hygiene of the workers that work with robots. Maybe the robot has to mess up one of thousand parts just because we feel better. Is that the solution? I don't know, but we have to discuss it. Then the question is, who should be interacting with robots? Well, as long as robots look like this, no worries. But as soon as my kids can no longer tell that there is a robot teaching them or a person, there is a fundamental question to be raised. And we already have that with voice assistants. There are now voice assistants when you call a hotline that are so good that you might not be aware that you're talking to an artificial intelligence. Do I have the right to know that I'm not talking to a person? Or do you say, no, it doesn't matter because I still get the service? So I think this is also an interesting dispute. Well, robots and elderly people, and then there are more esoteric topics like, should robots enhance humans? Human body augmentation. Do I have a robotic eye, a robotic leg? Or, well, yeah, I cannot do anything about the weight. That is my own problem, but anyways. But is this okay? Is this allowed? Is this something that we want to? 
But as soon as we open Pandora's box and do body enhancement, will you one day be forced to do it because you cannot compete without it? So, and later on, as soon as we build the first really sentient, intelligent, and feeling robot, maybe one day, 60, 100 years down the road, do we become the creators? Because so far, we have been part of creation. No matter what you believe, if it's just chance because some cells were meeting in outer space, or if you believe in God or in higher identity, um, the question is, so far we have been part of creation, but we could become the initiators of new creation. And also that is something that might change our complete perception. So let me quickly put this in a nutshell. Um, I do believe the future of robotics has already started. I don't have to tell you this because you're standing at a robot festival. Um, I do believe software and artificial intelligence is the key to that because they will, they will profit from... Wow, that's a cool effect. They will profit from each other. They, I cannot build smart robots without those technologies. I do not believe, though, what this gentleman once said. Bill Gates said, a robot in every home by 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, this would be in four years. I cannot imagine that everybody in Africa or India or Australia or, or Europe or Asia will have a robot in their home. Maybe in 2040, maybe in 2060. But what I do believe is that our children will grow up as the first generation that has daily contact with these technologies. My kids not. Yeah, okay, my kids know now our vacuum cleaning robot. But the generation after them, so their children, our grandchildren, will be the first generation R of robotic natives. You know what we are? The last generation of robotic immigrants. We still do have a very analog migration background, but we will feel, and in your case, even foster and build these changes. And we have to take responsibility for it. The technologies will be very diverse. It's not just robot arms like this or robot trays that deliver you cookies. This is also robotics. Autonomous driving will be robotics. Drone deliveries might be robotics, okay? I know a lot of companies are divesting right now, but still it's an, it's an important topic. And finally, human-robot collaboration. And you know what? I shouldn't tell my wife. Um, my dream is always the love of my life, the only woman I would leave my wife for, Jetson's Rosie, the robot housekeeper. Imagine you have a system that does all the chores in your house that you don't like doing. That would be so amazing. Actually, there are studies with the 18 to 25 year olds. If I give them one hour of time, they give me 30 euros. That means if I give them three hours of time every day, they're gonna give me 100 bucks every single day. So there's a huge potential and a huge market. You know, in that case, we cannot build it yet, but it's gonna happen one day, and I want to see it as soon as possible. But as I said, we have to take responsibility for technology, and technology is neither good nor bad, also that technology, but it depends on what we use it for. And you might know what, what Robert Oppenheimer said when he saw the effects of the atomic bomb. He said, now I'm become death, the destroyer of worlds. We're meddling with important technologies, and they are very disruptive. So the question is, how do we shape them in a form that benefits humanity and will not pose a threat to humanity? I'm not believing, and a lot of new wise men and women are currently saying, robotics is going to destroy us, Robo robots are going to kill us. Sorry, this is nonsense, especially because they don't have an intention on their own. But I do believe that we have to discuss these effects. We have, for example, to ban autonomous warfare, if you ask me for my opinion. Luckily, the United Nations are currently discussing a ban on, on autonomous warfare. The question is just, what do you call autonomous? And people in the streets are afraid of that. They are afraid of the Terminator. We know that it's not going to happen, at least not within the next 50 years. But still, people out there are afraid. So this is, I think, where robotic governance comes in. 
some sort of regulatory frameworks to shape the future of robotics. Why do I believe that self-regulation, for example, could help, or, or governance frameworks? Well, it helped with child labor, it helped with other topics like corporate governance, IT governance. So this is nothing new. But it means that we have to change the way we're thinking. We have to start, for example, to foster an educated and realistic public discourse about technology. Because if I now go out on the streets and ask people what perception of robots they have, if they're not working in any field connected to robotics, then they're usually coming up with something like that. Either they're super happy because they're gonna tell me Jetson's Rosie or Wally -E or Baymax or whatever is going to happen in two or three years, or they're gonna tell me we're all doomed because there are bad fighting, killing machines that are going to destroy humanity. Which is simply not true. Oh, sorry, somehow the design got a bit messed up. Anyways, um, we have to involve all the stakeholder groups. That means industry, academia, maybe the labor unions, and also the general public. We have to explain technology to them, and then we have to find a way to regulate it. We have to find a minimum consensus. What do we want? What do we not want? I think currently, the question about autonomous warfare can be answered pretty easily. The question about where do we want robots to take over some of our work and where not, that is a more difficult one, but we have to, to get into it. Then I would love to see a robot manifesto, and forgive me, I'm a robot scientist so, uh, and a computer scientist, so it has to be a prime number, has to be the 11, 13, 17 laws of robotics, and I would like to see that industry is then discussing them and then really trying them out. And if they work, like for example with corporate governance, no? that you say, okay, we shouldn't be bribed, I shouldn't accept money from somebody to do a deal and stuff like that. If I do this, then we can think about how this soft regulation can transition into hard regulation, into legal frameworks. The other way around, what we're currently seeing in artificial intelligence, that the European Commission is coming up with a suggestion to limit everything that is artificial intelligence, and in many cases call it a critical application, I think that is inhibiting innovation. So in that respect, I do believe we have to start with soft regulation and transition into legislation. If you want to find out more about it, well, it's currently a hobby project of mine, so roboticgovernance.com. Uh, and the other thing I want to make you aware of, because a lot of you will get invitations, is we're currently working at the largest study on the future of robotics. So we're going to ask 200 internationally renowned experts from industry, from the application of robotics, and from academia about their opinion on robotics in 2035, 2050, and 2070. And you might be asking, why 2070? That's absolutely science fiction. Well, ask Usama Khatib, who's going to be here tonight, or this afternoon. He built the first compliant and safe robot in 1982. It took industry, yes, the Puma robot, ask him. So he built that one, and to, for industry to come up with the first product, it was 2011, 30 years after. So the question is, what is going to be the big next thing in robotics that is at least as breath breathtaking as collaborative robotics? And this is why we're doing that. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't run too much out of time. Um, I absolutely enjoyed being here. If you have questions, I don't know if we take any. No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay, thanks very much. I'm gonna be around. Enjoy the conference, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique.